Okay, welcome back everyone. In this lecture we will talk about speciation. And speciation is the process by which organisms become distinct from other organisms. So one species becomes distinct from another. Um, let's just get right into it. So um, the question that you might often hear from people who are, you know, like to debate the topic of uh, you know, evolution in general, is, well, if humans evolved from apes, why are apes still around? And so that question is um, actually pretty silly when you know the actual full story. And so it's easily explained. And the answer to that is, the reality is that humans did not evolve from apes. Um, humans and this chimpanzee, for example, we evolved from a common ancestor. So somewhere down the timeline of Earth, um, a, a common ancestor was, was around. And then over billions of years, we evolved to be genetically distinct uh, species. Now, we've already talked about ways in which the genetic code of an organism can be changed and ways in which um, this this you know evolution can occur um, so we'll, we'll, we've, we'll go back over those um, as we go through this lecture uh, but just to just uh, you know the I always like to bring this up because it's it's the first question that often people will bring up is well why you know people think we evolved from apes and that's that's just not the case we share what is a common ancestor, and note that this, this common ancestor is no longer around. So uh, let's just move on. So speciation, uh, by definition, is the evolutionary process by which populations evolve to become distinct species. So what is a species? Because in order for that definition to make sense, we need to get our working definition of a species. So for this class, a species will be defined as any two individuals um, can be members of the same species if they can reproduce and make fertile offspring. And so by, you know, going off of that logic, if any two individuals uh, cannot uh, mate and then re make uh, offspring that are themselves fertile, they are not part of the same species. Now, I have to say uh, for this class, because different uh, sciences will define species uh, somewhat differently. So this definition is basically the biological species concept, where uh, any two individuals can be members of the same species if they can reproduce and the offspring can reproduce. And why is it that the offspring must reproduce? Well, if you look at organisms like mules, which are the offspring of a horse and a donkey. By the way, mules have been uh, used by humanity, uh, you know, to great success to, to uh, you know, be pack animals that would, would carry their, their objects for many miles. They are the offspring, like I said, of a horse and a donkey. Now, of course, we know horses uh, can mate and make horses, and, and th those horses can mate and make more horses, and we know the same is true with donkeys, but horses and donkeys are just genetically similar enough that they can, obviously in uh, captivity, be bred and t have offspring, mules, which are obviously very, um, you know, interesting combinations of both of these species. However, mules themselves are unable to produce more mules. And the reason for that is the number of chromosomes of a horse and a donkey are not the same. And so the mules end up having an odd number of chromosomes. And as you know, to make an offspring, uh, usually each parent gives exactly half the amount of an organism's chromosomal count. And so when you have an odd number, you can no longer make a half uh, an exact half uh, amount, uh, right? 50% won't go uh, into odd numbers. And so um, you can no longer make a mule from two mules. And so 
we, we do not, based on the biological species concept, consider mules to be a species. Okay, so that's the basic rule. Now, where does this, because of course there are sort of exceptions to every rule. So just based on the same idea, we know lions can make other lions and so on and so forth, and tigers can make other tigers and on down the line. But what happens if lions and tigers mate? Then you get what is called a liger. Now, first thing I want to point out is notice how large these ligers are when compared to this tiger. They are huge animals. And the reason for that is they actually have no genetic uh, code to say stop growing. And so they kind of just have like gigantism and they just continue to grow. Kind of, kind of interesting. Um, but the weird thing about the uh, ligers is that female tiger, female ligers have been shown to be able to be fertile. Now, two ligers cannot produce another liger, but a tiger and a liger, or a lion and a liger, have sometimes shown to be able to reproduce. And so, uh, my hard and steady rule that I just showed you uh, kind of gets a little wonky when we talk about ligers, because of course there are exceptions to every rule. Um, but in, in reality, it's kind of the same, because two ligers have not been shown to make other ligers. And so um, basically we're gonna we're gonna hold fast with our rule here that if two organisms can mate but their offspring are not fertile, they are not considered to be the same species. Okay, so how does speciation occur? Well in order for speciation to occur we said reproductive isolation has to occur, whether that means they cannot reproduce at all or the offspring they produce are not fertile. And reproductive isolation occurs when two groups of the same species live separately and obviously do not interbreed. Over time, if that isolation between the two groups remains, we will see the changes take place between the two groups that we talked about, which are the mechanisms of evolution, either mutation, natural selection, genetic drift, or you know all of the above happening at some uh, in some way. So there's two types of speciation. The first is called allopatric speciation, and the etymology for allopatric means different fatherland. Um, and so what that means is that allopatric speciation means that some geographic barrier separates two populations so that they have a different land, basically, different fatherland. And that geographic barrier could be a river, a mountain, or an ocean, and it causes those two groups to be reproductively isolated from each other because they just can't get to each other for hundreds of thousands of years, right? If there's a mountain, you're not going to be able to walk across that mountain or an ocean or a river. And over time, those mutations occur, natural selection acts, genetic drift occurs, other mechanisms of evolution, they act upon those two groups such that they become genetically distinct species. Um, a really good example of allopatric speciation, one of a few that I'll show you, is the uh, Darwin's finches. Um, and this occur in the Galapagos, which are a number of islands, okay? So these species get separated because they're on different islands. There's about 15 different species of finches on the Galapagos Islands, and they each look different. They've got specialized beaks for eating different types of foods, like insects, seeds, flowers, cactuses, some use tools. So they're all different because they are on different islands. And so this is an example of allopatric speciation. Another example are the Grand Canyon squirrels. And so maybe you're not familiar with this, um, but when Arizona's Grand Canyon was formed, squirrels and obviously other small mammals and organisms that had once been part of a single population um, would no longer be able to access each other and reproduce with each other because there's this new geographic barrier. And that's just going to allow them to, to not be able to interbreed. And so that squirrel population is just undergoing allopatric speciation. And so what we have um, are two separate species. So on the left here, we have the Kaibab squirrels, and they inhabit the north rim of the Grand Canyon, and the Abert squirrels on the right inhabit the south rim. Um, and so according to uh, National Geographic, um, those two species uh, are, are only found on those sides. So kind of interesting. You can see 
um, they kind of have similar traits, but they also have much different uh, traits as well in terms of coloration and, and sort of like overall look to them. And so just in the time that the Grand Canyon uh, formed, which is obviously a very, very long time, uh, these squirrels have changed that much. And, you know, the Grand Canyon is a, is a vast expanse, but, you know, they're still in the same uh, country, you know, so in the same state even. Uh, so just an example of how powerful uh, moving two populations and giving them many, many years uh, to only interbreed with themselves can, can cause uh, speciation to occur. Also, I, I should point out that if you put two of these individuals together, they would not be able to mate. So they are definitely different species. So pretty interesting. Um, the, the next is Sympatric. So if Allopatric is different fatherland, Sympatric, same fatherland. Um, and so you might think that geographic barriers are always going to be required for speciation to occur because, you know, what else is going to stop organisms from breeding together? Um, but Sympatric speciation is speciation that occurs right in the same area. But there are going to be barriers that create the reproductive isolation. And there's going to be pre-zygotic barriers and post-zygotic barriers. What is a zygote? A zygote is what happens when you combine sperm and egg. So there are barriers that happen before the zygote forms. And then there are barriers that happen after the zygote forms. So let's talk about each of those. So the pre-zygotic barriers are factors that prevent the zygote from ever forming. That could be behavioral isolation like the birds we've seen who sing different songs or do different dances, where the female of one species is only going to be attracted to that song or that dance. One of the common examples of this that I'll show you is the eastern and the western meadowlark. And so these guys certainly look very, very similar. Uh, it's impossible, basically, to tell with the naked eye uh, what, what species they are, eastern or western, uh, by, by looking at them. Uh, but genetically, they are uh, completely different. And the reason that they are different is because they've developed different songs. And these songs are so different that the females of one species will absolutely not mate with males of another species. And so that is uh, behavioral isolation. How about temporal isolation? Well, we have the eastern and the western spotted skunk. Obviously, very, very similar looking to the eye. But these species do not and cannot mate with each other because the time in which the females are ready to mate doesn't match up. The eastern spotted skunks breed near the end of winter, while the western one breeds in the autumn. And so they are just never ready to sync up. And so this temporal or time isolation is a prezygotic barrier. How about habitat isolation? If two species of amphibians, or in this case, in the example, reptiles, live in the same area, but one prefers an aquatic environment and another prefers a terrestrial environment, they will not mate. So any, but I don't know why I put amphibians there. I guess I was just thinking about amphibians at the time. It's any species. If any two species live in different habitats, they are not going to obviously want to interact or mate. And so we have uh, two, this, two different species of Thanops, Thanopphis, which is a snake, and one lives on the land and one lives in the water. And obviously those two are not going to mate. And so that is habitat isolation, another prezygotic barrier. Let's talk about these postzygotic barriers. And these are the barriers that prevent two species from producing viable offspring, even though they can certainly uh, have intercourse and have an egg be fertilized by a sperm. So remember the Liger example. Uh, the liger or the mule can be produced, but the liger itself cannot reproduce. Um, but sometimes uh, offspring can also be produced, but even though uh, they are, their health won't allow them to survive to adulthood. Um, and finally, a zygote might be produced, but will not develop into a fetus as just genetically they become non-viable. And so, you, you know, you get a couple of cells and then they, those, those cells just die because they, they never become a fetus. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna leave it there. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this lecture. Hopefully it wasn't too difficult and you got any questions, always feel free to email me and let me know. So I'll see you guys in the next one.